Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Uh, so my name is Hans Daus. Uh, I'm the head of uh, immunology, uh, and I'm sort of the academic lead on the Institute of uh, Immunity and Transplantation. We are very excited, and we are very proud that we can introduce to you tonight uh, this concept. Uh, so I'm a, a UCL-appointed uh, person, uh, but uh, I'm also the head of the clinical immunology here at the Royal Free. Uh, and it's an illustration of how the interaction between one of the world-class leading research institutions like UCL works really very well together with a, a world-class uh, hospital uh, such uh, as the Royal Free Hospital. So I would like to give you uh, just sort of, uh, uh, an overview and a sense of what type of research uh, uh, we are planning to perform in the Institute and how it affects uh, disease uh, and how it links uh, to our patient population. It's a joint uh, uh, initiative uh, between the Royal Free uh, uh, Foundation Trust uh, uh, and UCL Partners. Uh, UCL Partners, a lead, one of the lead academic institutions is the UCL itself. Uh, and UCL as a university in the last few years has, has consistently scored uh, amongst the uh, uh, top 10 worldwide. Uh, so here is sort of a, a, an overview of some of the uh, challenges uh, of the, uh, in developing a new type of therapies uh, and new type of diagnostic tools that improve our patient management. Uh, on the left down, down there, uh, you can see uh, sort of the basic uh, research discoveries here. Uh, and over there you see new type of uh, therapies uh, and a new type of diagnostics of interventions. Uh, and going along this pathway from research discoveries uh, into new types of therapies and, uh, 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 and diagnostics, uh, that pathway is called the translational research pathway. Uh, and at the moment it takes uh, uh, approximately 17 years to move from a basic research discovery to move it all the way along the translational uh, pathway to develop new types of therapies and diagnostics for our patients. And this is something that is unsatisfactory unsatis uh, and it's also something that is recognized uh, by government that we need to improve our capability of transferring research developments for our patient benefit. Here are then some uh, classical gaps that need to, to, to be filled. Uh, those are bottlenecks uh, that we know do exist in terms of moving the research along for a patient benefit. Uh, and the Institute is very much about providing expertise uh, and uh, providing infrastructure that will help us to bridge the gap uh, and move uh, the research developments much more rapidly sort of into our patients so that our local and the global population can uh, benefit. Uh, and the way that of the research sort of, uh, activity in the Institute is, is organized is sort of schematically again shown here. There are certain sort of experimental platforms that are really the core business of, of the Institute. Uh, and those experimental platforms are really uh, very much supported by expertise that exists within UCL. Uh, and so it is the development of new type of vaccines, the development of uh, gene therapy approaches, uh, the development of cell therapy and transplantation approaches, sort of uh, our existing transplantation program, but then also the next generation uh, transplantation that is going to be based on of bioengineering and regenerative medicine. Uh, so if we look forward in about sort of 10 years time, it's most likely that the number of organs that are going to be transplanted to patients no long, longer come from donors, but they come uh, from uh, research developments that allow us to produce artificial uh, organs uh, uh, in the laboratory. One uh, thing uh, that would be worthwhile noticing is that, that this, uh, it, it's a new type of concept of treating patients because all those uh, treatments, uh, we refer to them as biological therapies. So they are no longer drugs, they are no longer the conventional medicines that, uh, that are being used, uh, but they are the biological uh, interventions. Uh, 
Uh, and the major difference between those type of biological therapies and the conventional therapies is that those therapies are a one-off therapy. So the way it's designed that the biological system is used, those new therapies are introduced, it resets the patient's immune system uh, using the gene therapy or cell therapy approach. And a one-off uh, approach then gives us lasting uh, effects, lasting effects in terms of either enhancing the immunity against uh, diseases such as cancer and chronic infection. So those, are uh, those are diseases that are associated with an impaired immune system. If the immune system is decreased, uh, uh, then the risk of cancer is increased and the same is for chronic infection. So those type of interventions would allow us to reset the immune system to get lasting efficient protection against those type of diseases. In the other spectrum, we've got the autoimmune diseases and some inherited uh, conditions. Uh, and those are conditions where the immune system is dysfunctional. So it, 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 uh, 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 it, uh, it, it can't protect in the inherited diseases and in the autoimmune conditions, uh, it's overactive. Uh, uh, and the autoimmune conditions are, for example, diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis. So there are those type of biological interventions uh, are aimed again to be a one-off therapy. We are resetting the immune system uh, that uh, the immune system stops destroying those cells that produce insulin that are required and are missing in the case uh, of uh, type 1 diabetes. So here is sense of, of a schematic uh, overview of the, the disease entities uh, that are going to be targeted uh, in the institute. Uh, and again, broadly speaking, we can uh, uh, subgroup them into cancer and chronic infection. Uh, so there are conditions where the immune system has an impaired function. Uh, in particular, we've got active uh, research programs that target to improve the immunity against the leukemia lymphoma, gastric cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, and melanoma. Uh, and some of those approaches are based on gene therapy approaches. So there the immune cells are, uh, uh, are used, new genetic information is introduced that allows those immune cells now to attack those type of malignancies. And if successful, that type of therapy will have lasting benefits. Uh, chronic infection, we've got an active program uh, looking at a virus called cytomegalovirus. Uh, We've got a large the HIV clinic here, some of you may be aware of. Uh, we've got uh, a, a large uh, 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 hepatitis cohort here, that's a hepatitis B virus, and tuberculosis. So those are infectious uh, agents uh, that, are, uh, that are seen in our uh, clinical departments. Uh, and the type of immune interventions uh, that we are developing in the institute aim to boost the immune system that it can protect the transplant patients or the HIV-infected patients from the diseases that are linked to those infections. The autoimmune conditions, I've mentioned diabetes as uh, one example. Uh, uh, scleroderma is another uh, uh, specialty that we have got here in the, at the Royal Free Hospital. Uh, and then inflammatory bowel uh, diseases. We've got an active research program that looks into the genetics of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Rare diseases in immunology, we've got one of the largest uh, immunodeficiency cohorts uh, in our department. Uh, so those are patients that have a genetic defect that impairs the function of the immune system. Uh, and in conjunction with Great Ormond Street, we have developed gene therapy approaches. So, so those are uh, world-leading gene therapies that have benefited already children suffering from this immunodeficiency. And then hemophilia uh, and uh, the amyloidosis. So those are other so rare diseases where there is a lot of uh, a specialist expertise uh, at the Royal Free Hospital. So then here are some specific examples of how research has really made a tremendous uh, difference for patients affected by those diseases. So here, for example, the, in the rare disease uh, category, I've already mentioned uh, the primary immunodeficiency. Uh, 
you probably remember there were some sort of 20 years ago the, uh, the, the, the babies that had to live in a bubble. Uh, those are the babies that were born with an immune defect. Uh, and the bubble served to shield them, to shield them from viruses, from bacteria, from any pathogens that, uh, uh, that uh, children might be exposed to. So nowadays, those uh, children, we can take their stem cells, insert healthy copies of the defective gene, give those stem cells back to those uh, children, and those children, they can, uh, uh, they can uh, live a, a normal life. So it's really uh, life-changing, so this type of therapy uh, for those children. Uh, for hemophilia B, they're uh, uh, an expert, a colleague uh, working here, Amit Nathwani. Uh, so hemophilia B, there is also defective genes that, uh, that leads them to increase the bleeding uh, uh, in patients. Uh, so he has made a genetic construct whereby the healthy copy of the gene is introduced uh, into the liver of the patients and those patients, again, they can have now a, 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 li a much improved uh, quality of life because they no longer depend on the chronic use of the hemophilia drugs that are currently used for the treatment of this condition. I've already mentioned a virus, this cytomegalovirus. Uh, it's a virus that affects particularly, it's a herpes virus, it affects particularly our transplant population. And there we have active research programs to develop vaccines to develop uh, cell therapy and gene therapy approaches. Uh, and you will appreciate that some of those cell and gene therapy approaches are quite innovative. So they are amongst the world leading uh, uh, initiatives in this particular area. And then finally, uh, we've got uh, 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 ca uh, cancer. Uh, we've got an active uh, program uh, in the treatment of leukemia, gastric cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, and melanoma. So those are just a, a type of cancers where we uh, currently have active research activity. So here is uh, then uh, again an, an overview of what the institute is about. Uh, it benefits really from the UCL and the UCL partners uh, in environment and, uh, uh, and our vision is really to put the patients, to put our local uh, as well as a national and international pa uh, patient population uh, at the center of our research attention. Uh, so the patients uh, uh, inform the research that is being performed uh, and then the research developments should feed back into the management of our patients in terms of developing novel diagnostics uh, and developing a new type of therapies. And the way we can achieve that is, is really by a multidisciplinary approach. We can take a, a advantage of the vast research resources that UCL has to offer. We've got a, a, a well-characterized local patient population as well as national and international uh, uh, patients seen in some of our rare disease uh, 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 clinics. Uh, and then we have first-class clinical services here at the Royal uh, Free uh, combined with nursing uh, sort of, uh, expertise uh, that is uh, second to none. And it's really this combination that is required to achieve the translation of research into patient benefit. We need to have all the ingredients. We need to have the top class researchers. We need to, to have highly motivated and skilled clinicians. We need to have our research uh, uh, nurses and our nursing staff. And we need to have an engaged patient population. Uh, and I'm very glad that quite a lot of you were able to make it tonight uh, just to see how important the patient is to us. So here are then the specific programs that are going on, the vaccine development focused on uh, CMV in particular, uh, then cell therapies based on resetting the immune system for patients that suffer from autoimmune conditions such as diabetes. Imagine in, a, in, in the future there will be a one-off therapy for type 1 diabetes. Those are those children that need to inject uh, several times a day the insulin or now there are some pumps where the daily injections are no longer needed. Imagine a day when we can give those uh, uh, patients cells that produce insulin, reset the immune system that those cells are accepted and it's going to be a one-off uh, therapy with lasting benefit. 
Uh, and then, uh, uh, again, enhancing the immunity in uh, cancer, chronic infection, and in the immune deficiencies. So, development of innovative uh, health approaches also has uh, sort of a commercial aspect, and it is important to consider the commercial opportunities because we will only be able to transfer our research development into large scale therapies for patients. Uh, if we can get uh, engagement uh, by the pharmaceutical partners, by the pharmaceutical uh, industry, who really have got the skill of large-scale production of biological therapies, uh, as well as those new cell and gene therapies. And here are just some historic examples of immune molecules have, have already been a huge success in the treatment of a number of diseases. And those immune molecules are primarily the antibodies. So in 2010, the market for antibody-based therapies was approximately 25 million. So immune cells and the type of gene therapy that we are developing now, it's estimated that next year there will be a market of 3.1 billion. And as, this, uh, as those developments uh, mature, it's very likely that this market will reach a similar size uh, as uh, the market based uh, on the antibodies. So phase one uh, is uh, about to complete. Uh, so we have successfully engaged the Royal Free Trust and UCL. It was a joint investment uh, providing uh, approximately 1,800 square meters of new space. UCL has facilitated the new, new recruitments in areas that were of strategic importance uh, to, to us. Uh, and the Royal Free has provided uh, the, the space. Uh, so on the 10th of June, we will have official opening of phase one, which is a refurbished space that is on the second floor here of the Royal Free Hospital. Uh, and then phase two uh, will be uh, a new building, and Andrew will talk uh, more about the details of this building. Uh, so that will provide us with state-of-the-art research facilities. It provides us with everything that, uh, that is required to move research more rapidly from basic research into new type of uh, uh, therapies. So we have su submitted uh, an application uh, to help to, uh, to get government support uh, uh, in February 2000 uh, uh, and uh, uh, in February of this year. Uh, and we hope uh, that this uh, funding application will be successful. Uh, and uh, here are some of the, the projected uh, dates, uh, and Andrew will talk uh, more to you about this. Yeah. Um, my name is Andrew Panicker. I'm Director of Capital and Estates here at Rural Free, which covers all the things like sort of management of the estate and also new build and the maintenance and repair, that sort of thing. So it's a broad remit. Um, I think you've heard from Hans about the exciting, life-changing work that's going to occur in the new institute. I'm just going to go on to um, get the slides. Um, the phase, phase two of the institute, which is what we're here to discuss, I mean, we've heard briefly about phase one. I just want to go back and talk about phase one very briefly. It was um, finished in April. It was about 2,400 square meters in total. Um, we spent about just under five million pounds on the accommodation there. It has 11 outpatient rooms, clinic rooms, um, about 21 clinical trials bays, and it has accommodation for the researchers, it has lab space, and it has off, uh, offices as well, as well as some welfare accommodation and a dispensing pharmacy. It was completed about four weeks ahead of programme and completed on budget. The phase two building um, is about 14,000 square metres in total. Um, it's built over six floors, we can, um, and it will cost around 46 to 47 million. That's the estimate at the moment. We haven't tendered it, so it's quantity surveying estimates. 
what we're going to do is we, it's over six floors. It will accommodate three floors for UCL, for this new institute. It will have a floor for Anthony Nolan, who currently occupies some space already on this site. We'll have some space for charity officers, and we will also accommodate a patient hotel to the rear and a 60-space car park. The building is going to be located on Heath Strange Gardens, which is, you probably all know that space. What we're going to be doing is demolishing the whole of that space. We're going to be taking all the planting that is there, and that uh, the memorial benches and everything, we're going to be taking them away, setting them aside for a while. Um, we we'll demolish the car park and then start building upwards. Um, the build could take anywhere up to about 16 months as soon as we start digging the first hole in the ground. In case you um, haven't got your bearings, I mean, the Heath Strange is here. We've got Main Pond Street here. Currently, there's an access road that runs up here, and the access to the car park is there currently, and the road runs up to... Um, the top. We've had discussions with planners, actually I'll take it back, it may be on this um, building, we've been discussing since September. The main constraint we've had in the whole design of it, because actually we were thinking about making it slightly taller to make uh, so more accommodation, but we've got the um, limitation of this area here. The planners are saying that they don't want it to go any higher than the podium, which is effectively the second floor. We do have some plant, plant um, rooms on top of there, but that is our controlling aspect. In discussion with the planners, we started with just some base footprints, showing what we wanted to do, and then we started looking at the context of where this building was going to sit. We looked at the church, which is there, and then how this whole tower was originally built and the materials that it was used. And what we tried to get out from the discussion was, with the planners was what was important to them. So the building itself is set it fin finished roof level, marries up with the podium. The construction is going to be um, largely masonry, but with what's called ribbon glazing. So the ribbon glazing will run round, so there'll be lots of natural daylight penetrating these d deep footprints. Um, we'll go on to this because this is quite important, because what we're trying to do is the context of where it is sitting and the importance we're putting onto the open space, because I'm really wary of the fact that we're going to be taking away Heath Strange Gardens, which is a well-utilised and sort of therapeutic area. People go there and sort of sit and remember um, loved ones who've been in the hospital. So... The feeling of open space is important. So the building is there, in that space there. What we're going to be doing, and this is the Pond Street, what we're going to be doing is taking away this access road, effectively. Um, there will be no longer a general traffic, traffic of vehicles up that road. It is going to become a largely pedestrianised building, um, walkway, but we do have to maintain some access for emergency vehicles like the fire service. So, but most of it is going to be pedestrianised. We're going to use a mixture of soft and hard landscaping. There'll be lots of trees, there'll be some grassed areas, flowers, and we're going to start reinstating the benching from Heath Strange Gardens along this area here. The other piece of work we're doing is discussion with Camden Council about trying to open up all this area 
here to give a much better feeling of open space and make it more usable to everyone. So what we have here is as you arrive into the um, hospital from Pond Street down here and generally now you go up there and go up the road to the car park. This is the front entrance to the Institute. As you can see, largely a lot of masonry but ribbon glazing going round. The final design, although we've shown you sort of these images, the final design isn't fixed yet. We, we, what we've got to do is submit a planning application. That planning application will have to go, th we'll have to go through a lot of detailed design, a fair amount of consultation, but we will then have to have discussions with the planners. This is by no means fixed. It might change slightly from this, um, and I'm interested, we've st started talking right at the beginning of this session about actually we'd like some feedback on the thoughts of this building. So when I finish talking, I might just come back and leave this slide up to allow us to have some further discussion. Um, so what we're going to be doing is, you can see, it's largely becoming a pedestrianised area with a greater feeling of open space up here. This gives something, an idea into the scale of the building. Um, that is effectively the finished level of the pl podium plant rooms up there. So what we have is the charity offices and the entrance area, the car park, UCL floor, anti-nolon, and then two more UCL. And we'll have plant on here. Because the plant is going to be re really important because of the categories of labs that we will have in there. It requires its own dedicated ventilation systems and very specialist extracts. At the back here is where we'll put the patient hotel. The intention is, this is, I say, is about a 16-month to 20-month build. It's a very complex site. Um, we've got a lot of demolition to do, and it's within the heart, if you like, of an operational hospital. Um, we have emergency access requirements here. We have um, radiation bunkers underneath um, that we have to deal with. So it's very complex. Over the side here, at this side, we have our main theatres and we have imaging. So it's actually, because the way we'll be constructing, it will be a quite slow process at first. So it will take 16 to 20 months to build just because of the potential impact of getting the building out of the ground on the rest of the hospital. But we're hoping to start this. Um, potentially, we're going to be going to planning, starting planning discussions during the early part of summer, submitting a planning application towards the end of the summer. That could take a minimum of about 12 to 18 weeks once it's submitted to get approval.